What's up, everybody? I'm the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and before we begin, I've got to say that I've never been in a street fight or even a situation where I've had to use karate in self-defense. I like to think that this has something to do with my amazing situational awareness and conflict avoidance skills, but more likely it's because I'm a six foot one, relatively fit white kid who's only ever lived in the suburbs and gentrified neighborhoods, and whose favorite pastimes all involve staying home and avoiding sketchy places. It's pretty commonly said that the goal of learning karate is to never have to use it, and of course you'd want to avoid being in a dangerous situation. But before today's topic, I felt like I needed to be clear about my lack of personal experience with street violence. The only truly sketchy experiences I've ever had were being bullied by a sheriff's department and having people yell harassment at a march that I was part of, before they ran away because they were a much smaller group than we were. Scary? Yes. But dangerous? For the most part, not really. Miyagi Chojun Sensei once said, Do not strike others and do not allow others to strike you. The goal is peace without incident. So far, I've personally managed to live by that principle, and I truly hope that everyone who practices goju ryu or any style of martial arts can say the same. Martial arts are, fundamentally, the study of the technique, theory, and application of physical violence. Even Aikido, the peaceful martial art, still contains techniques that could theoretically cause someone to fall and break their arms or legs if they didn't know how to break fall correctly, whether or not those techniques could actually be pulled off in real life. However, most martial artists that I've met aren't fans of violence by any stretch. A consensual fight or a sparring match might be one thing, but most of us would hate to be put into a street fight or a violent confrontation. While a seasoned MMA fighter might be relatively sure that if it came down to a brawl, they'd be better situated than their untrained friends, they'd probably still avoid having to fight if possible. That's just basic self-preservation. The masters of karate realized this when they were laying the foundations for spreading their art into Japan and the rest of the world. Karate may not have an inherent philosophy, but most of history's most famous karateka taught their own personal philosophies of violence to their students. Before training became a heavily commercial product, students were often selected by their teachers and underwent periods of physical conditioning and moral training before a teacher ascertained whether they were willing to take them on as a student. It would be very embarrassing if a master taught his techniques to someone, only for them to go out and use them to smash skulls together at a local pub, or to use those techniques to become a thief or a criminal. Nowadays, karate has become much more widespread than they could have possibly imagined, and with this has come a huge change in the purpose of the martial art. What was once todi jutsu, the Chinese hand techniques, has become karate do, the way of the empty hand. As this art was being spread to wider and wider groups, the ethics and personal responsibility that went into choosing a student had to be merged with the teaching to become part of the art and instruction itself. The man who kickstarted the shift from todi jutsu to karate do, Funakoshi Gichin, found it helpful to inscribe his moral principles into a written reminder for his students to constantly keep in mind. In his Niju Kun, The Twenty Precepts, Funakoshi laid out a set of moral and ethical principles that made up the core of his karate philosophy. These principles were intended to develop the spirit and ethics of the karateka as the training was improving their strength and technique. The first of these was, karate begins and ends with respect, which is a statement that guides the conduct in many dojos of all styles, not just Shotokan. But the second principle, the one that Funakoshi believed truly expressed the essence of karate, is the famous karate ni sente nashi. And that phrase is what I want to talk about today. Let's get into it. First things first, let's translate this short phrase to get an idea of what we're dealing with. The most common translation of karate ni sente nashi is, there is no first strike in karate. The term that's being translated as first strike, or alternatively first attack, depending on who you ask, is sente, which is composed of the characters for before and hand. Jisho.org, an online Japanese dictionary that has saved my butt in Japanese class more times than I can count, defines sente as the first move, usually in the context of board games like Go or Shogi. However, it has a second definition, which is seizing the initiative, which seems to make much more sense in the context of karate. But was Funakoshi really trying to say there is no seizing the initiative in karate, or was he trying to speak to some greater meaning? Apart from being a karateka, Funakoshi was also a poet. He was known by the pen name of Shoto, meaning pine waves, and this legacy followed him all the way to the founding of his dojo, the Shotokan, or Hall of Shoto. While not all of the 20 precepts are poetic, Karate ni Sente Nashi 
can be and often is written in the five character form of certain types of kanshi, Chinese poetry written by Japanese authors. The shortness of these five character stanzas, much like other short form Japanese poems such as the haiku and tanka, means that much of the meaning of a poem is derived from the act of interpretation by the reader. Because karate ni sente nashi is often written as this form of stanza, it needs to be interpreted as such. Previously, I've mentioned that the name of Goju Ryu was drawn from a book called the Bubishi, and it's a similar five character stanza of an eight line Chinese poem that is the inspiration for this style's name. And just like the name Goju Ryu has been interpreted and explained, so too has Karate ni Sente Nashi. Many karateka have argued that this maxim is intended very literally, saying that it's not acceptable to strike or to attack an opponent until they've initiated the fight. You're never supposed to be the one who starts the fight, and you're also never supposed to be the one who makes the transition from verbal abuse or threats into actual combat. Proponents of this theory offer as justification the idea that every kata begins with a block, which is the case in a lot of kihon kata. Among the core goju ryu kata, there are a few that don't begin with a block or a defensive technique, such as seipai, but if you interpret the kamai or the ready posture as a defensive move, you might still be able to hold that interpretation, so I won't challenge it on those grounds. Other people interpret this phrase as a more general commitment to nonviolence, embracing the do of karate do, and saying that karate is a way of life, designed to train the body and the mind into a peaceful state. Karate, like many martial arts, is seen as a method of self defense, and so many people have qualms about what counts as defense and what crosses the line into aggression and their idea of first strike is key in this conception. The interpretation that this phrase forbids striking someone until after they've attempted to physically injure you is the most hotly contested one. Many people have pointed out various inconsistencies with this theory, but the biggest way that it conflicts with the goal of self-defense, in my opinion, lies in a very simple fact. Actions are faster than reactions. To choose to strike, all you have to do is decide that you're going to strike, and then send nerve signals from your brain to your muscles and have your muscles carry out the action. Compare this to the reaction to guard against an incoming strike. First, you must see the signs of a strike with your eyes, or hear the exhalation with your ears, or otherwise sense that a strike is coming. Then, you process that information in order to know that you're being attacked, at which point you make the decision to raise your guard, from which the process is more or less the same. These additional steps involved in recognizing the strike and deciding how to respond make it clear that the former would be much faster. However, it's also the case that a single strike can end a fight. While it's fairly rare to see this in street fights, since getting off a clean strike in the chaos of a scuffle is almost impossible, a strong punch to the jaw can knock someone out, and even a weaker punch can daze or distract someone to the point where they can't reasonably fight back for a few seconds. One way of thinking about this, though, is to imagine that your attacker has a weapon. By the point where you're reacting to a knife strike, your outcomes are limited to deciding not if, but where you'll get cut, and even then your choices are very limited. Unless your attacker stupidly chooses to strike very slowly and hold their knife arm out still for you to grab, you probably won't be able to do that knife defense technique that you learned either, since most knife defense is, to put it bluntly, bullshit. If you wait for the attacker to make the first strike, you're already in danger. No serious fighter would give you the horrible advice to let yourself potentially get seriously injured before even beginning to fight back. So, with the option of literal first strike eliminated, how else can we interpret sente? Well, an interesting interpretation comes courtesy of Mark Tankasich. In a blog post on Ian Abernethy's website, which was adapted from an article he published in the Hiroshima University of Economics Journal of Humanities, Social, and Natural Sciences, Mark discusses whether a preemptive strike might be valid in a self-defense situation, as well as how this relates to the famous phrase. Inspired by Ian Abernethy and the reactions to his opinions on preemptive striking, Mark interprets the act of threatening or intimidating someone to itself be an act of violence. Once someone has made up their mind to start to threaten or attack you, the act of violence has already begun, even if they haven't thrown a punch or drawn a weapon or in other ways directly escalated the situation. To demonstrate that this was in keeping with interpretations by contemporary karate practitioners, Mark tells the story of Motobu Choki's encounter with a former student. The student charged in and declared his wish to fight his former teacher with a knife. Motobu Choki, seeing that he couldn't dissuade this belligerent from the fight, accepted the challenge, but with the condition that they exit the shop first, since it was a personal conflict and he didn't want to inconvenience the shopkeeper or any of the patrons, who were innocent bystanders. He walked behind his disgruntled student 
as they moved to leave the shop. However, as soon as the challenger reached the door, Motobu Choki kicked him from behind and, according to some retellings, broke his would-be attacker's spine. While this might seem like it's a first strike or an escalation of force, it's important to remember that his former student had begun hostilities by challenging him and by not being able to be dissuaded from fighting. Even though he hadn't swung his knife yet, the fight had already begun, and there wasn't a less violent way to conclude the fight, at least in the interpretation of those present. In this story, Motobu Choki both threw the first strike and took the initiative, but he did not violate the precept of karate ni sente nashi in the minds of Mark, Ian, or Motobu's contemporaries. In fact, Funakoshi himself discussed preemptive strikes in his Karate do Kyohan, considered the master text on his style of karate. He writes, When there are no avenues of escape, or one is caught even before any attempt to escape can be made, then for the first time the use of self-defense techniques should be considered. Even at times like these, do not show any intention of attacking, but first let the attacker become careless. At that time, attack him, concentrating one's whole strength in one blow to a vital point, and in the moment of surprise, escape and seek shelter and help. Here too we see another example of striking before your opponent has the chance to, and even of seizing the initiative before they have a chance to force your hand. It would be pretty odd to argue that Funakoshi didn't understand his own precept. In the article that I pulled the earlier quote from, Ian Abernethy draws a parallel to the Book of Five Rings, a treatise on strategy by the early Edo period samurai Miyamoto Musashi. Musashi discusses the idea of initiative in three ways attacking as a reaction to your opponent, attacking at the lapse of attention as your opponent attacks, and attacking at the moment where your enemy has made the preparation to attack. This concept of a preemptive or preliminary strike is such an old one that a book written by a samurai whose most famous duels were fought mostly before Japan invaded Okinawa advocated for its use. In modern times, we might not have two swords, but we do have two hands, and the principle of striking before your enemy can injure you is more or less the same. So it would seem that the prevailing and best interpretation of karate ni sente nashi is that you should never attempt to escalate violence or cause harm for harm's sake. When someone has committed to doing violence or has surrounded and threatened you, making a safe escape impossible, throwing a preemptive strike might be the quickest way to end the conflict or to open an opportunity to get to safety. Even if violence hasn't officially broken out, the immediate threat of violence is itself violent, and responding with a preemptive strike is acceptable under this interpretation. While it might be less literal, Perhaps a better translation of karate ni sente nashi is, there is no escalation of force in karate. This video wasn't conceived to be just about the idea of preemptive striking, though. The phrase karate ni sente nashi may have been my starting point, but there's so much more to explore than just the question of when it's okay to hit someone. What I intend to do from here is to use this discussion as a springboard to discuss the nature and ethics of violence in a more broad sense. The first thing to understand is, what is violence? As I mentioned in the discussion of Motobu Choki, violence doesn't necessarily begin with the physical act of an attack. Clearly, the most easily understandable form of violence is the use of physical force to damage a person or property. Punching someone is violent. Breaking someone's arm is violent. Breaking someone's phone can even be violent. But Motobu Choki's student only brandished a knife and declared his intent to fight but that was considered to be sufficiently violent to warrant a preemptive strike. Someone who mugs you is being violent, regardless of whether they actually cause you any physical injury. Threatening someone with violence, whether by directly indicating a desire to do violence, or by indirectly demanding compliance while relying on the unstated assumption that non-compliance will cause you to use violence, can still itself be considered to be a violent act. Recently, however, several thinkers have proposed an even more extensive definition of violence than the personal use or threat of force. For instance, the concept of psychological violence is the idea that creating a state of psychological harm can be considered to be violent. For example, gaslighting, which is when an abuser consistently lies in such a way to cause their victim to question reality, is considered by some people to be a form of violence. Consistently bullying someone to the point that they become disturbed or self-harmful would also be considered a type of psychological violence that can be perpetrated by a group. It might be even the case that no individual is directly responsible for the victim's distress. The individual actions of bullies are oftentimes very minor and not even physical, but the aggregate effect of many people constantly insulting or degrading a victim can have a violent effect. Even if the people involved don't directly harm the victim, their actions, put together, can lead the victim to both physical harm and psychological anguish. 
Internet celebrity and real-life philosopher Slavoj Žižek talks about several types of violence in his book, which is aptly titled Violence. In it, he proposes that violence exists in three different types. So far, everything that I've mentioned is subjective violence, meaning direct violence caused by an identifiable agent. Following this, he defines symbolic violence, which is violence that's encoded into acts of speech. This can include things like incitement to violence, where you could blame someone calling for a person to be injured even if they didn't themselves injure that person. However, Zizek's idea of symbolic violence primarily covers the idea that language itself, by naming and ascribing certain qualities to a concept, and therefore denying it certain qualities as well, acts violently against the objects that it describes, and to the subjects who use it. Finally, Zizek proposes the idea of objective violence, sometimes also called systemic violence which is a type of violence that's the natural result of a system running smoothly. He calls this type of violence objective because it has no direct agent, but rather it manifests as the result of many other factors and occurrences. One of the core arguments that Zizek makes is that acts of subjective violence are often rooted in the overlying structure of objective violence that's going on in the world. The simplest example, although maybe the least accurate to Zizek's point, is the idea of a mugger or a thief. Now, the act of theft is subjectively violent, whether because the thief takes property from another person, or because they do physical injury in order to take property from another person. But much of the time, their action isn't a spur-of-the-moment decision. The thief may have chosen to steal because they were in poverty, or because they couldn't get a job in order to provide themselves necessary income. Or they might be employed, but they could be stealing because their employment isn't sufficient to keep them stable and safe from financial ruin, maybe because it pays low wages, or is an at-will position and they have no job security. In the Jean Valjean case, My sister's child was the child of death. My name is Jean Valjean. I stole the bread. The subjective violence of theft stems from, and is a reaction to, the greater objective violence that has kept his sister's child in poverty, left to starve. Thomas More, in his book Utopia, ascribed much of crime to these same objective underlying causes of poverty, or a general lack of stability. Of course, Zizek doesn't limit his discussion to just this obvious dimension, and instead he focuses on the broader dimensions of violence. Writing about a series of riots in the suburbs of France in 2005, he says, The protesters, although effectively underprivileged and de facto excluded, were in no way living on the edge of starvation, nor had they been reduced to the level of bare survival. People in much worse material straits, let alone conditions of physical and ideological oppression, had been able to organize themselves into political agencies with clear or even fuzzy agendas. The fact that there was no program behind the burning Paris suburbs is thus itself a fact to be interpreted. A few pages later, we see Zizek's interpretation of the violence, which is that the riots were simply a direct effort to gain visibility, aiming to create a problem that couldn't be ignored or swept under the rug by society at large. He classifies this type of violent outbreak as a reaction to objective violence as a passage à l'acte, an admission that the group committing the violence cannot directly make any headway towards their goals. Now, let's bring it back to Karate ni Sente Nashi for a minute. If we look at this phrase as an injunction not to escalate violence, and only use physical force as a means of preventing or mollifying greater violence, then the existence and concept of objective violence raises some interesting questions about the utility of subjective violence. Were these suburban rioters behaving in accordance with karate ni sente nashi, even though their outbursts were violent and not oriented towards self-defense? The context behind these riots, which was an internal discrimination against Muslim French citizens, could be interpreted as an ongoing type of violence at the objective level. As Zizek says, the protesters did not claim any special status for themselves as members of a religious or ethnic community striving for its self-enclosed way of life. On the contrary, their main premise was that they wanted to be and were French citizens, but were not recognized as such. This non-recognition could naturally lead to all sorts of material consequences, such as harassment, discrimination, denial of work, and other reactions, all of which could impact one's life in a harmful, potentially violent way. However, at the same time, we do have to recognize that these efforts did not sufficiently defend the community against that sort of violence. This might not factor into everyone's understanding of karate ni sente nashi, which doesn't criticize violence attempted in self-defense that fails at its goal. However, when one considers that the purpose of this violence wasn't even directly intended towards preventing overall objective violence, 
or even having any direction at all, it becomes much more difficult to justify. While the outburst of violence might have been an expression of impotence at the system that caused it on a broader sense, the individual intentions of the perpetrators didn't distinguish it from the same type of violence that Karate ni Sente Nashi disavows. Michel Foucault, in his book Discipline and Punish, talks about violence through the lens of power, with the result that violence is a way of exercising power relations over others, whether it be directly against the body or against someone's soul, which he says itself is a technology of power over the body. In a later section of this book on panopticism, he describes a thought experiment where, to really oversimplify the concept, every member of a society is capable of being surveilled at any given time, but none of them are ever sure if they're being watched at a given moment. While this thought experiment takes the form of a building, he also likens it to the police apparatus, which sanctioned a generalization of the disciplines that became coextensive with the state itself. Foucault loved to use pretty dense philosophical jargon, but for our purposes we can understand this as sort of an analogy, where the state is the theoretical watcher of the panopticon, and the police are its various eyes. You're always capable of being seen, but you never know for certain if you are being watched, or even if the police are looking at you, whether you're being suspected of wrongdoing and possibly subject to punishment. Since both surveillance and violence are technologies of power in the jargon, it might be possible to conflate the two and claim that a panopticon-style system of constant watching is itself a type of violence. Whether this would be subjective or objective comes largely down to how formalized the system is. If the watcher is, as Foucault poses, the police force, then it would be a firmly subjective type of violence. However, this isn't necessarily a condemnation of the police, even when viewed through the moral lens of karate ni sente nashi. The role of the police, according to some people at least, is to disincentivize people from committing acts of violence and to arrest those people who have a proven history of violent behavior in order to prevent them from doing any further violence. While individual departments or officers might mistakenly use more force than needed, the core of their role is to reduce overall violence. And in fact, since they can't arrest someone until they've committed a crime, they are quite literally prevented from taking the sente, the initiative, even if we go by the first strike definition. However, there is another element to the role that the police play that I haven't mentioned yet. While much of the common perception of crime involves obviously violent acts like murder, assault, or even theft, plenty of the criminal code is occupied by nonviolent crimes. A homeless person isn't committing a violent crime by sleeping on a public park bench or underneath the awning of a closed building. They're neither injuring anyone, nor are they even using private property. However, since it is illegal for homeless people to sleep in certain places, the police are allowed to remove them, using tools including violence and arrest. Another potential example could be workers on strike. Strictly speaking, striking workers are both permitted to choose how they spend their time, and are free to use their speech and nonviolent actions to criticize their employers. However, police are often called to respond to strikes with batons and tear gas. And of course, there's the fact that police are, as part of their job duties, required to use their discretion to determine what counts as criminal activity that requires their attention. This means that officers can choose to overlook some crimes, even violent crimes, based on their personal evaluation of the situation. This could lead to an unwillingness to hold friends, family members, or fellow officers to account for technically illegal activity. And when we combine this with systems of objective violence, this leeway can result to unconsciously prejudicial treatment of certain groups. Are these necessary evils? Are they issues that need to be worked on within the police system? Or is there perhaps some alternative that could be pursued to keep communities safe? Karate ni sente nashi may stipulate that there's not supposed to be an escalation of violence, but it certainly doesn't preclude violence as a morally defensible strategy. Simply put, Violence can be necessary and justified. This can include psychological and even systemic violence sometimes. Let's say there's a group of people who intend to manipulate, exploit, and injure children. You could definitely argue that structuring society in a way that hurts these people, perhaps by restricting their movement to avoid potential victims, might be justified in preventing a larger amount of violence from occurring to the children. And even when the police are violent, you could argue that it is still in the service of preventing violence as well such as stopping a criminal from continuing to hurt people, or defending themselves against an uncooperative subject. So if we want to avoid escalating violence, we need to consider when and where violence can be used in broader self-defense. I think that the notion of personal self-defense is pretty well covered, so instead I'd like to talk about community self-defense. 
While a punch can defend you against an attacker, it can't stop members of your community from starving or getting evicted because they can't pay rent because of medical bills. Community self-defense is most famously expounded by anarchist philosophers such as Pyotr Kropotkin and refers to a broad variety of actions that a community can take to prevent harm or violence from befalling its members. Like in the case of personal self-defense, most of these are non-violent. Instead of, for instance, talking someone down who's looking for a fight, it might mean making sure that your streets are well lit at night to prevent traffic accidents. Instead of keeping your ears clear to listen for people who might be approaching, it could take the form of feeding the poor or the homeless. However, community self-defense can also include violent methods. How far is community self-defense able to go before it's considered escalating? Well, the simple answer is that it's not that simple. Individual community members can often disagree about this, and especially when it comes to types of violence that aren't physical, it can be difficult to quantify what counts as preventing greater violence. Many philosophers who have written about community self-defense, or just self-defense in general, say that the goal is to prevent greater violence, but which counts as greater? A life of low-grade anxiety that a group of people might attack you, or the quicker but more acute violence of a swift jab to a racist's face? It's become kind of a symbol. <laughs> And also, what if your actions don't have the desired effect? How much resisting are you able to do before your resistance becomes much more violent than what it's trying to fight against? These questions don't have simple answers, if they even have answers at all, and I'm definitely not the karateka to try and find them. I believe that every community has to discuss these questions and come to a consensus about their answer. In the spirit of karate ni sente nashi, I would encourage you not to do physical violence if at all possible. And in the spirit of Miyagi Chojun Sensei's words, I encourage you to do whatever you can to maintain a peaceful life whenever possible. But the concept of violence is a complicated and contested one, and even among groups who share the same definition of violence, individual judgment on what an acceptable response is can be highly personal. Here at the very end of this video, I'd like to return back to karate and to the obligations that we have to our communities, whether that's the communities we live in, the dojos we train in, or the world at large. During and after the Second World War, Miyagi Chojun Sensei, Higa Seiko, Toguchi Seikichi, and many other karate masters held off on teaching their martial arts and focused instead on protecting and rebuilding their communities, many of which had been decimated by the disastrous Battle of Okinawa. In that moment, caring for those whose homes had been destroyed, whose children or neighbors had been killed or captured, was a much greater priority than training karate. Where violence is necessary to defend a community might be a difficult discussion, but nonviolent community self-defense is both easy and kind. If the goal of karate is to reduce overall violence and improve the safety of oneself and one's community, then these small and simple acts of kindness are perhaps the most effective way of achieving that goal. Karate ni sente nashi is an ethical statement that karate, and those who practice it, ought to use both their art and their life to protect and better themselves and to support and care for those around them. As a modern karate community, we ought to strive for the same. Both in your personal life and in the dojo, this can look like modesty, friendliness, charity, or any number of generally desirable traits. If your dojo has a student who loves to get into brawls, doesn't know how to take it light when sparring, or doesn't honor tapping out, it might be necessary to intervene and help them learn how to be less dangerous. If your uncle or some other relative makes your younger family members feel unsafe at family gatherings, it might be a good idea to give them a talking to, or at least stand up for your other family to let them know that they are being seen. And if you have a habit of being overcritical of yourself, de-escalate that by being kind to yourself as well. However, in the words of Konishi Yasuhiro, karate aims to build character, improve human behavior, and cultivate modesty. It does not, however, Guarantee it. Thanks for sticking with me to the end of this incredibly long video. I'd like to thank my college philosophy professor for both forcing me to read Foucault and encouraging me to read Slavoj Žižek for fun, both of which made it a lot easier to go back and look for references when I was researching this video. If you enjoyed this, please give this video a like and leave a comment letting me know what you think about it. If you'd like to see more videos about the philosophy of karate, subscribe to this channel, and turn on notifications, both of which are necessary for seeing when I release new videos. I've been the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and don't forget, strike hard, strike fast, no mercy.